tonight, the sole survivor of a deadly attack on a Muslim family tells his story for the first time. The emotional victim impact statement. That heartbreak doesn't really go away. As the court considers whether to label the murders terrorism. The daring military rescue of 10 people who survived a plane crash in the Northwest Territory. Uh, it was quite the travel for them at night and in the blizzard. After another school shooting in the U.S., the high-profile push for change. We don't like to admit that this is really a problem. We turn our head and go, go right back to our camp. Matthew McConaughey on the lasting impact of a mass shooting in his hometown in the breakdown. This is The National with Ian Hennemansi. It was another grueling day inside a London, Ontario courtroom. More of those who knew and loved the Ufsal family addressing the man who deliberately killed four members out of hate. The only survivor, a young boy left injured and orphaned. Now 11 years old, the boy offered his victim impact statement today. Read by a cousin, it described his pain and confusion since Nathaniel Veltman ran down and killed the boy's family with a truck in 2021. I won't be able to have fun with them anymore, the boy wrote. I won't be able to live with them anymore. When I have kids, they're not going to have grandparents. CBC News has chosen not to name the boy to protect his privacy after such a devastating tragedy. Thomas Dagler shows us more of the boy's emotional statement and the grieving community rallying to support him. Surrounded by loved ones in the witness box, an older cousin read the words of a young boy left orphaned. The offense has made me very sad at the fact I can't talk with my family anymore and make new memories with them. It's the first public statement from the Ufzal's surviving child since his sister, parents and grandmother were all murdered because they were Muslim. The emotional message shared in court ending two full days of victim impact statements delivered by relatives, friends and a community left scarred. This whole situation has forced uh, not just me, my siblings, but any Muslim youth to grow up. The truck attack at this London intersection in June 2021 sent the surviving boy into urgent surgery with a broken leg and collarbone. He's being raised by family and his maternal grandmother who rushed to Ontario from Pakistan. In his victim impact statement, the boy writes he misses his chats with his sister, urging other children to cherish their loved ones. Arib Siddiqui read his cousin's statement in court. Me and Yumna had plans. Then when she finally got her driver's license, she'd drive me around. She said it would cost 25 cents per drive. Now, I'll never be able to see that. And about the boy's parents. Once they leave you, you start to really notice how much they cared, by, cared about you. The convicted murderer, Nathaniel Veltman, sat in the courtroom expressionless. All of it part of his sentencing process that's not done yet. We're going to hope to persuade the judge that this was not an act of terrorism, that it was uh, the, an act uh, that was predicated on some of his mental deficits. At the Islamic school in London, a part of Yumna Afzal lives on. The mural she painted urging students to shoot for the moon. Art, her young brother considers a fitting memorial. Thomas, so much pain in those victim impact statements, and all of that may factor in, in one of the issues the judge is considering. Yeah, she still has to determine whether this attack amounted to the legal definition of terrorism. And according to the criminal code here, uh, part of that definition is an act carried out to intimidate a segment of the public. Now, what stands out to me from the past few days is it's just that, the fear that the Muslim community and uh, loved ones described feeling while just uh, crossing the road or simply living in Canada ever since that truck attack. So uh, the judge is going to take all that into account on top of further arguments presented later this month, Ian. Thomas Dagler in Toronto. A military rescue crew is telling their story tonight of parachuting into the site of a plane crash in the Northwest Territories. The passengers were construction workers headed to a job site. Juanita Taylor reports on the dire conditions rescuers found them in. 
In blizzard-like conditions and complete darkness, with just flares lighting the way, three military search and rescue technicians parachuted out of a Hercules airplane. On the ground below, 10 people who survived a plane crash in a remote part of the Northwest Territories. In the wreckage, we found uh, four patients, two unable to move. Recounting the difficult rescue, Sergeant Vincent C. Benoit says the other six were sheltering in a tent, exposed to frigid winds and trying to stay warm. We had some initial information on the condition of the uh, um, passengers on, on, on board the aircraft, enough to make some decisions based off that. Uh, we had the location, uh, we had the description of the airplane and we, uh, they, we knew what other assets were going to be available in the area as well. The Air Tindy plane, a twin otter like this, was attempting to land on a lake using skis. It went down 300 kilometres northeast of Yellowknife on December 27, just 16 kilometres from the Dyvik diamond mine. An emergency response team was able to head in from there too, on snowmobile, to bring medical and survival equipment. There is a team of four members of the mine that came and were able to make their way to the scene. Uh, it was quite the travel for them at night and in the blizzard. Really hard worker, tough people, and they were a huge assistance to me. High winds hampered the rescue, forcing the Hercules to circle for nearly two hours. It's a little more challenging to, to fly the whole procedure when the winds are high. But again, we just take the things that we do in training and, and adapt them to the conditions of the day to be able to safely do it. After nearly a full day, the crash victims were eventually able to be picked up and flown to Yellowknife for treatment. Juanita Taylor, CBC News, Rankin Inlet, Nunavut. One person has been killed after a bus from Montreal crashed in New York State. The Flix bus coach was headed to New York City. 23 people were on the bus, 11 were injured, one seriously. Not yet clear what caused the crash. Police say the roads appeared dry and clear during the day. Police near Toronto have laid a charge of first-degree murder after the death of an infant. They were called to this home yesterday evening where they found the baby who was rushed to hospital. Police won't say how the baby died or who has been charged, only that they're not looking for other suspects. Rescuers in remote western Japan are still racing to find survivors of the devastating New Year's Day earthquake. That disaster also triggered a massive landslide that swept away entire buildings. Sasha Petrisic begins with a small measure of hope beneath the rubble. With hope fading and time running out for those still trapped under earthquake rubble, a surprise in Suzu City. One elderly woman pulled from her home alive. Another discovery next door. An elderly man, bruised and confused, but conscious. Unlikely survivors after four days without help in a disaster zone. Noto Peninsula was devastated by the 7.6 magnitude earthquake on New Year's Day, triggering fires. And then the tsunami wave came from the bay, he says, and through the streets. Thousands of searchers have been at work ever since, risking their own lives as aftershocks threatened to crash what hasn't already been flattened. Ominous landslides reshape coasts and valleys. Hurry, they yell on the day of the quake. It's crumbling as this one tears through a neighborhood in Wajima City, sweeping away houses and roads. It's a huge challenge, says Japan's Prime Minister Fumio Kishida. We have received offers of help from around the world, he says, including from Canada, but they've been turned down because of complicated logistics. Washington and Tokyo are discussing some assistance from U.S. troops based in Japan. As some 30,000 people are now homeless and running short of food and water, salvaging what they can from the rubble. What's my biggest worry, he says, whether people will ever be able to return. Sasha Petrosik, CBC News, Toronto. On the eve of the third anniversary of the January 6th riots at the Capitol, U.S. President Joe Biden hit the campaign trail, pointing to that moment as a clear reason for re-election. 
As Paul Hunter shows us, Biden is framing this election as a choice for or against democracy. Joe Biden's message to Americans was blunt, at stake in the coming presidential election. Democracy, American democracy. That's what the 2024 election is all about. He promised it was In this much-hyped speech, effectively kicking off his re-election campaign this year, Biden forcefully took on his presumed Republican challenger. The choice is clear. Donald Trump's campaign is about him, not America, not you. He's willing to sacrifice our democracy, put himself in power. He calls those who oppose him vermin. He talks about the blood of America as being poisoned, echoing the same exact language used in Nazi Germany. USA! Throughout the speech, Biden referenced the January 6th riots three years ago. As Trump pushed to overturn the 2020 election results, then did nothing to stop this. It was among the worst derelictions of duty by a president in American history. But Biden is struggling in the polls, and Trump knows it. This guy Biden is the worst we've ever had. The worst. <laughs> Using Biden's own narrative against Biden. Welcomed by countless supporters. Joe Biden is a threat to democracy. He's a threat. In turn, Biden's also already leaning on an old friend in a new fundraising ad. Our democracy depends on you. It really does, folks. That's no joke. Will it resonate? We need you. Biden's inherent message to voters is, in a sense, an even bigger question. We all know who Donald Trump is. The question we have to answer is, who are we? That's what's at stake. Who are we? Will that resonate? Will that draw enough voters to Joe Biden? The straight-up suggestion from Biden is that it has to. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. The U.S. Supreme Court will also have a major role in the upcoming election. It announced today the justices will review Colorado's unprecedented decision to remove Donald Trump from the 2024 ballot. The court will hear arguments next month to consider whether Trump could be barred from federal office over his role in the January 6th riot and whether that ruling will apply nationwide. Both Colorado and Maine ruled Trump should be removed from the ballot. U.S. regulators have approved Florida's plan to import cheaper drugs from Canada, but that decision has revived fears in this country of a potential shortage. Katie Nicholson on what this could mean for Canada's supply. These bottles of drugs jostling through a Mississauga factory are destined for Canadian medicine cabinets, but not if some states have their way. If it goes ahead, then we should be worried. The U.S. Federal Drug Administration has agreed to let Florida import bulk quantities of Canadian generic drugs, in particular ones used to treat diabetes, HIV AIDS and mental health. We already see um, shortages of 10 to 15 percent of drugs here in this country on an annual basis and large-scale importation from Canada to Florida is just going to make that worse. But in order for Florida to start placing massive orders, it has to clear a number of hurdles, including pushback from home. In a statement, the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America called the FDA's decision reckless and said it poses a serious danger to public health and said it is considering all options. Florida will also have to prove imported drugs are safe and effective and relabel them to FDA specifications, which can be costly. Despite that, at least eight other states are waiting for similar FDA approvals. But people on this side of the border shouldn't panic just yet, says the Canadian Pharmacists Association. You know, don't do anything differently. You don't need to go to your pharmacy and stock up or refill. Uh, now that in itself could cause a shortage, so we certainly don't want to encourage people to do that. Canada's Minister of Health also saying in a statement it will take all necessary measures to protect the drug supply. So, Katie, what are those measures? The Canadian Pharmacists Association basically broke it down this way. They said, first of all, a state has to find a Canadian manufacturer that's willing to produce supply for them. And then they have to go through Health Canada. They have to make assurances that any export 
won't threaten the Canadian supply. They even have to produce records. And they tell us that the rules are robust, but they always have to be on the lookout for loopholes. And you can bet that states are going to be looking for those. After all, the cost of drugs in the U.S. sometimes two to three times what it is here in Canada. Katie Nicholson reporting from Toronto tonight. New jobs numbers from Statistics Canada show the unemployment rate remains unchanged. It was 5.8% in December, the same as November. The report did show some job growth in healthcare and technical services, but it's being offset by losses in manufacturing and retail. More than 20,000 retail jobs were lost last month. So the job market is slowing, and recent reports show the housing market is too. Real estate forecasts predict the first part of the year could see that trend continue. Though, as Nisha Patel explains, not everywhere. In Ontario, this winter has been cool. The housing market downright chilly. You're seeing properties sit, you know, 30 days. This real estate agent says faced with high home prices and high mortgage rates, buyers have been holding back. What a buyer is willing to offer on a property and what a seller is expecting there's a gap that needs to be bridged. Toronto just saw its worst year for home sales in more than two decades, according to the real estate board. Vancouver sales also slipped significantly. As for 2024... It's not like it'll feel like a gangbusters um, year from a sales perspective. Average national home prices could fall more than 8% in the early part of this year, weighed down by the two biggest housing markets. That's according to a forecast from TD Bank. Though prices may stabilize by the summer, when economists predict the Bank of Canada could cut interest rates. We do expect them to take their policy rate meaningfully lower this year. So, you know, uh, the Bank of Canada's policy rate is currently 5%. We'd expect it to fall to about 3.5%. Lower borrowing costs would be a relief for buyers. When it comes to owning a single-family home, just 10% of households in B.C. have enough income and 22% in Ontario though it's less challenging in the Prairie and Atlantic provinces, where 50% or more can afford it. Thanks for the chat earlier today. In Alberta, Max Singh's phone is ringing off the hook. The mortgage broker says the housing market there is much hotter. Multiple offers, uh, um, bidding well over asking price, very few conditions. The average detached house in Calgary costs half as much as Toronto. That's luring buyers to the province in record numbers. We've seen a lot of deep pocket out of province investors who can easily snap up properties and, and sweep some of those local folks off their feet. So that old saying holds true. Real estate is all about location. Nisha Patel, CBC News, Toronto. The Department of National Defense has confirmed that it sent a second plane this week to help get Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and his family back from a vacation in Jamaica. National Defense said the second plane was sent with a team to repair a maintenance issue spotted before takeoff. Back in September, another plane carrying the Prime Minister was found to have a faulty part delaying his departure from the G20 by two days. An Ottawa woman has had her application for citizenship held up because of her activism against Russia's war on Ukraine. I felt betrayed uh, because I was hoping that I am safe here in Canada. Why she could face prison time if she returns to Russia. Next. Plus, Matthew McConaughey weighs in on gun violence after another school shooting. I'm a dad, you're a dad. We're parents. Let's meet right there. Now you and I can have a conversation. I'll speak to the movie star and activist. And later, a dramatic story of survival in the open water. I had a shark come to visit, I had a bit of a look and decided I wasn't very tasty. The fisherman who says his watch saved his life. We're back in two. Sorry, officers, are you able to just tell us um, what you have... Disgraced former athlete Oscar Pistorius was released on parole today. He spent nearly nine years in prison for killing his girlfriend, Riva Steenkamp. He's expected to live at his uncle's home in Pretoria. A condition of his parole, sessions on anger management and violence against women. A Russian anti-war activist is speaking out tonight after her criticism of the Kremlin put her application for Canadian citizenship in jeopardy. As Matthew Kupfer explains, a conviction in Russia has left her in limbo in Canada. It feels pretty bitter when I think about it right now. 
Maria Kartasheva is still raw over her citizenship ceremony last spring. She had to step aside because she was facing criminal charges in another country. Like I had to sit there listening uh, this judge uh, saying how all of those people deserved to get this Canadian citizenship, <sighs> which means I didn't deserve it. Kartasheva has lived in Canada since 2019 and is a permanent resident. She says she told immigration officials about the charge she was facing in Russia, a law passed after the invasion of Ukraine, banning spreading what the Kremlin deems false information about the Russian army. Kartasheva had posted photos on her blog and encouraged people to share information about the massacre in Bucha of more than 400 people. Russia has denied any atrocities. Just last month, she received a letter from Canadian immigration officials saying there might be an equivalent law in Canada, citing a section of the criminal code about harming individuals with false information over telecommunications. Kardasheva was asked to defend herself. I felt betrayed uh, because I was hoping that I am safe here in Canada. This is ridiculous. I mean, this is a political offense. and. I think is universally recognized as such. This law targeted prominent critics and sent a chill through Russians at home and abroad. They may well mean to intimidate others uh, of the Russian community outside Russia who might be tempted to, to also engage in public criticism of the Russian government. Immigration officials say they'll review Kartasheva's documents, but she'll have to make her case. It'll ultimately be up to Maria and to her legal team to establish that that equivalency isn't here in this case. Meanwhile, Kartasheva hopes she'll be able to have another citizenship ceremony, oath and all. Matthew Kupfer, CBC News, Ottawa. Marine researchers believe a legendary killer whale observed for decades in the waters off the BC coast has died. She's one of the most prolific female killer whales ever known. Why they say the orca's legacy is so important. Plus, from a healthcare system near the breaking point to weight loss drugs, and a toxic drug supply that's taking lives every day. Lauren Pelly and Christine Burak break down the health trends they're watching in 2024. Plus, in the wake of another U.S. school shooting, a Hollywood star talks about his work to prevent gun violence. I think values are where we come together. My interview with Matthew McConaughey. The National breaks down the story shaping our world. Next. Canadian soccer star Tejan Buchanan today completed a multi-million dollar signing for one of Italy's greatest teams, Inter Milan. To be the first Canadian, yeah, it's, it's a big achievement and, and yeah, it's extremely exciting and, and I'm very proud, yeah. The 23-year-old from Brampton will be the first Canadian to play in Italy's top league. He'll wear the number 17 jersey. Buchanan was key to Canada's 2022 World Cup qualification and started all three games in Qatar. The life of an orca is being celebrated in BC. The matriarch known as Wake was one of the most prolific female transient killer whales ever recorded. And as Janella Hamilton shows us, she had a lasting impact on the West Coast population. And you can see she's got these, these two notches in her dorsal fin. Izzy uh, David it says it was a majestic one, moment when she first identified T-46 off the coast of Victoria. The boat stops and suddenly out of nowhere, there's this really large group of, of killer whales that comes out the fog. The transient killer whale was last seen in February off the northeast coast of Vancouver Island. Since then, her pod has been seen repeatedly without her. She was almost always seen traveling with her three sons and her daughter, so for her to not be seen with that grouping is quite rare. She was first observed in 1976 when she and five other orcas were captured in Puget Sound, set to be sold to an aquarium. But there was public outcry, and that sparked the end of the live capture industry in B.C. and Washington State. She had a brand new baby. The orca matriarch was in her late 50s, the average lifespan for a female killer whale. And in that time, she grew a vast family tree. She mothered eight calves who went on to produce dozens of offspring. She produced really greatly to the transient killer whale population and she made a really positive impact. 
Fisheries and Oceans Canada says unlike the region's southern resident killer whales, which are struggling because of dwindling salmon stocks, the transient killer whale population in Canada has seen significant growth year over year. Still, David says BC's whale watching community is heartbroken with tributes pouring in online. It's been sad, but everyone's just remembering her as the powerhouse as she was. Janella Hamilton, CBC News, Vancouver. Now let's break down the news shaping our world, including a conversation with actor, activist and author Matthew McConaughey. But first, the top health stories to watch in 2024. We are in a crisis situation and something needs to be done. Street drugs more toxic and more deadly. It's just getting worse and worse and worse. The potential threat of the next pandemic. It's not going to really be possible to prevent the transmission of viruses from animals to humans. New drugs snatched up for weight loss with risks and... We don't have enough staff. I felt like I was left to die in a hallway with an IV in my arm. A healthcare system buckling under the strain. Well, let's explore this with our health reporters, Lauren Pelly and Christine Birak, both in our Toronto newsroom. And Christine, let's start with you. What, what do you think is going to be the dominating health care issue of 2024? For Canadians, the big issue is, will the health care system be there for me when I need it? The reality is there are parts of the health care system that are working incredibly well. That doesn't really make news. But what we now know is what's broken. There's a shortage of family doctors, which is sending more Canadians into emergency rooms. There's a lack of hospital beds, which means more people are stuck in emergency rooms with no place to move inside the hospital. Staffing shortages, especially nurses, and wait lists for non-life-threatening surgeries are just painfully long. So what are provinces going to do to address the problems and improve the system for Canadians? Are they going to make changes based on evidence of what can work or ideology? We're already seeing major changes in Alberta and Quebec. Alberta is breaking its system into four parts. Experts say the changes don't make sense based on the evidence, uh, which leans more towards integration. Patients don't usually have one problem. Similarly, Quebec appears to be taking on an entrepreneurial vision, despite its own evidence that a social vision might be more cost effective and offer more efficiencies. Manitobans elected a new premier promising health care reform. Ontario's making changes. Uh, early info shows it's paying for-profit clinics more than hospitals to do the same work. Is that the way to go? So we'll be following those changes this year and breaking them down for Canadians. We all want the system to be there for us when we need it. Politicians are making critical decisions as to whether that will happen. Uh, Lauren, you've uh, done a lot of reporting on the opioid crisis. It's something that I've covered for a long time as well. And, and, and yet, you know, this problem remains as acute as ever. Ian, I think it's getting worse, and a lot of people now refer to it as a toxic drug crisis. It's gone beyond just opioids. The situation is worsening all the time. And I think what really says it all is a, a headline-making story that's happening as we speak. A 15-year-old boy in Montreal died in December. Uh, today, his family has come forward to local media saying he bought what he thought was OxyContin. It turned out to be another type of opioid that was far more powerful than even fentanyl, and he passed away at the age of 15. And we know, we have done stories with CBC now for years, looking at the types of victims of this growing crisis. Tens of thousands of Canadians have died from toxic drugs in recent years. People who were artists, people who were parents, athletes, youth workers. Those are the people who are passing away. And if you look at the numbers, in British Columbia, the province is averaging seven toxic drug deaths every day. In Ontario, opioid-related deaths among teens and young adults tripled from 2014 to 2021. So this is an issue we need to keep watching, and we need real solutions. But what those are depends on who you ask. There are heated debates happening over whether harm reduction sites or treatment centers are the way to go. Many former drug users say we need something sort of in the middle. But in the meantime, until we find a fix, the supply is getting more and more deadly, whether we're talking about uh, well-known drugs like cocaine or new emerging drugs like xylazine, which can leave people with horrific wounds. These are all the stories we've been covering, but we need to keep following this to figure out how to end this crisis as a country. Ian? Yeah, I'm glad you are, because, you know, there is fatigue on this story, I'll tell you. I hear it all the time, but it continues to kill people, and, mm -hmm. and I'm glad that you'll continue to, to watch it. Uh, Christine, we are seeing 
a lot of coverage and ads about uh, weight loss drugs like Ozempic and Rebelsis. Uh, what do you see the trend uh, in terms of those two drugs in the new year? I think the trend will continue in the same direction. The ads aren't going away, even though there's a shortage of the drugs. And Health Canada is telling doctors and pharmacists to ration the supply. No new prescriptions unless absolutely necessary. But the reality is the companies want to maintain this demand. They're ramping up production. They say the shortages should ease sometime next month. While there are positive aspects to these drugs, for sure, there are so many people taking them that we're also going to see negative side effects as well rare, but when you have millions of people on a drug, they become far more prevalent. We've started seeing gastrointestinal issues, suicidal ideation, and other side effects. I think we'll get more data from more studies in the coming year that'll shine light on the future of these drugs. They're not a one and done. People who use them need to take them for the rest of their lives, and the data will keep coming in. Every drug has risks. Is the risk-benefit analysis worth it? Do the risks outweigh the benefit? And as we get more data, the equation can shift. Either way, this new class of drugs will keep making news this year for sure. We haven't even mentioned COVID here, but uh, Lauren, in our last minute, uh, you're looking at the risk of animal pathogens jumping to us. Sounds, of course, terrifying. How concerned should we be? Well, let's talk about COVID for a quick second. We are in okay. year four of this pandemic, right? This is an illness that is still affecting so many Canadians. There's thousands of people in hospitals who are positive for this virus. And a lot of people have referred to this as a starter pandemic. Imagine if this virus had been more deadly. Imagine if it was even more contagious. So there are scientists around the world who are tracking all these different types of viral threats that uh, emerge from animal reservoirs. They can come out of different countries. You don't always know where it's going to hit. And finding them is a bit like a needle in a haystack. But even in recent years, we've seen everything from bird flu to mpox spread around the world, affecting new populations and new regions. So if we don't want something like COVID to happen again, we need to keep an eye on what threat could be coming next. Look, our Health Bureau has done such fantastic work in a large part uh, thanks to the two of you. So I appreciate uh, you speaking with us tonight. You're welcome. Thank you. Since the devastating school shooting in his hometown of Uvalde, Texas, Matthew McConaughey has been trying to bridge the American divide over gun violence. It takes a lot of courage to listen to another side. Why he's still hopeful progress can be made. My interview with the actor next. history of violence repeating in U.S. schools. Yesterday with a shooting in Iowa. In 2022, at actor Matthew McConaughey's hometown of Uvalde, Texas. How about that? It made him a voice for reforming gun laws. How can a loss of these lives matter? Now as an author, he's bringing a message to kids as well. My conversation with McConaughey touched on his message and his confidence that despite strongly held conflicting views in the U.S., change is possible. Matthew McConaughey, thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure, Ian. Good to be here. You're doing these interviews because you have a new children's book, and we're going to get to that in a little bit. But, but I want to ask you, first of all, about a big issue in the United States and one that you've been very much involved with talking about, and that is school shootings. You're from Uvalde, Texas. About a year and a half ago, there was a terrible shooting at Robb Elementary School. And, and maybe start by telling us the impact that shooting had on you. I mean, there's been multiple mass school shootings um, over the years, uh, particularly here in the United States. And uh, they all affected me as they affected everyone. This one was different because it was in my hometown. Um, when it happened, when I heard it, I immediately went back i knew where the shootings were i'd been there i almost went back there in my mind as a kid and uh, so it felt very present my wife called she was away out of the country and she said uh we got to go and i said i know when we pulled out of the driveway we knew and i've talked about this before that it was a one-way ticket meaning like you don't just swing into a town see how you can help for a weekend then walk away and say that's it um and we got down there and we listened um we were led um, we, we, we met families. Camilla's still in touch with a lot of the mothers and still talks to them pretty consistently. Very soon after that, found ourselves going to Washington to go, go talk to some people who could help make the changes. 
Camilla's got these shoes. Can you show these shoes, please? Wore these every day. Green Converse with a heart on the right toe. These are the same green Converse on her feet that turned out to be the only clear evidence that could identify her after the shooting. How about that? Shit? I think we have to admit these things first before we can go about changing them. Right now, we don't like to admit that this is really a problem. We'll talk about it, but we turn our head and go, we go right back to our camp. We go right back to our tribe, right back to our identity. Um, it's, uh, um, I, I talk about it a lot of the contradictions that we need to admit in my children's book. It takes a lot of courage to listen to another side, an opposition, a differing opinion, and then come back and make a choice. I had to look this up because I didn't be believe my memory, but 19 students and two teachers were killed at Robb Elementary School. Uh, Parkland, you know, not long before. I happened to be in Southern Florida when that happened, and I arrived in Parkland that night, and 19 people, many of them high school students, were killed there. I think 11 years ago was Sandy Hook. 22 people, you know, elementary school kids, were killed there. And every time, and same thing with Uvalde, it's like, you know, thoughts and prayers, you know, changes need to be made, never going to happen again, but mass shootings keep happening. Like, like how, it, that's got to be frustrating for you. I think it's frustrating for everybody. We have not found the answer, and we obviously can do better, and we have not found the solution. Nor is there going to be one-size-fits-all solution. On June 25th, 2022, the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act was signed into law following the Robb Elementary School tragedy in my hometown of Uvalde, Texas. Camilla and I just started this Green Lights Grant initiative to help these school districts fill out the, 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 a grant that gives them a really good chance of getting awarded this federal grant money, this first law that was passed in the United States in 28 years, to, to, to give grant money to safety in schools. Is that a solution? No. Is it a step forward? Yes. Um, Look, both sides are really, are really dug in. What, what, what on, on you know the staunch Second Amendments, and and then then you have some further on the left. They're like, we want no guns at all. I don't believe that it's gonna it's gonna um, be a uh, an answer right now that's going to satisfy one side or the other. But steps like this, like the Bipartisan Safe Communities Act, if we can get that money allocated to schools and then show proof of purchase that why that helped how it abated a certain crime, or maybe a counselor caught another student who was gonna do the wrong thing early. If we can prove that, those invisible assets, that will help us on our way to getting refunded and get the conversation going, hey, this worked, and, both, and on things that both sides can still agree on. But my question is, like, given what you know about your country and your state, and your concern about the, the, the school shooting issue, can America bridge this gap? I think values are where we come together. Value, there's the values that both parties, that both camps agree on. Hey, we may disagree on this policy. We may disagree on this law. We may disagree about how to go about this. But hey, I'm a dad, you're a dad. We're parents, let's meet right there. Now you and I can have a conversation. Now on opposing sides of the aisle, we can have that conversation and get a lot further than if we didn't bring that into the conversation. So values, I believe, are where we're gonna bind ourselves. I want to ask you about social media. You got you got like nine million followers on Instagram. You got you got three million followers on on X, which which used to be Twitter. And so you know the power and the perils of social media. So I'm kind of curious of what 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 you've learned about that. What what kind of advice you have for uh, for everyone about social media? It's the first time that we've mankind's been able to take something that we do, bam, press it out, send it, and then wait. I want to wait to see what those 9 million, some friends, some followers, some strangers think about it. And most of them don't know me personally. But what their response to what I put out, if I let it, will affect my day. We have to admit that. I want to go back to admittance again. And I'm 53. I've got a family. I've succeeded. I've won awards. It still affects me. <laughs> I talk to my kids about it, and I think we can all remind ourselves is, don't wake up every day thinking about what can I do that would be a good post rather wake up and think, what am I going to do today? What do I want to do? What can I do today? And while we're doing it, go, you know what? That might be really cool to share. Now let me post it, but not the other way around. A lot of wisdom there. Um, so let's make a transition to a much different medium, and that is children's books. So 
I'm a parent, my kids are adults now. You know, I, I, I told my kids some great stories, um, but I never thought any of them elevated to like the level of needing to be in a children's book. Why, why, why did you write a children's book? What's in the text and the covenants of just because is good for all of us, but something that it's never too early for children to just understand the context of the world that they're engaging with, um, the contradictions that we all each have. Just because they can choose doesn't mean that you have a choice. Just because they don't hear you doesn't mean you have no voice. How I feel about it may not be how you feel about it. Just to consider that. Uh, because the kids today especially are getting pressured more and more to go be absolute. Well, how do you feel? I had children said it before, wait, well, I, I don't feel good. So why? She said, I'm excited, but I'm also nervous. And they thought those were a dueling emotions. I, they felt like they couldn't have those two at once. I said, no, not only can you have those two at once, that's good too to have. And you will have those frequently through life. Actor, advocate, author, pretty impressive life. Matthew, thank you very much for speaking with us. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Thank you for the question. So our next interview here is with Rick Mercer. We confronted the quick-thinking comedian and satirist with some viewer questions and a strict two-minute time limit. This terrifies me, by the way. Yeah, okay. Eight and two terrifies me. Okay. All right. Well, you know what? All the more reason to do it. Are you all set? Okay. What person impressed you the most on the Rick Mercer Report? Rick Hansen. Three. What interview surprised you? First Jan Arden interview. And why is that? Because she was just so incredibly funny and sharp and generous, and I just adored her right out of the gate. Next viewer question. Please ask him who the meanest person was he encountered on the show. I would never answer that. <laughs> but there is somebody that comes to mind? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, coincidentally, yeah. Here's, our, here's our next question. Which prime minister was the most fun to have on the show? Because, you know, when you think fun, you think prime ministers. Um, well, it would have to be Jean Chrétien, and that is not a comment on uh, him as prime minister, but it's a comment on him as someone with comic timing. It was like, uh, you know, going into a room and cameras rolling with Eugene Levy or Martin Short. It was ridiculous wow. uh, how funny he was. And his timing was impeccable. What rant of yours got the most reaction? A couple of rants got a big reaction. One about a young man who took his life uh, from after being bullied, mm. uh, got an awful lot of uh, reaction. And then there was one about voting uh, that, um, yeah, that got a lot of attention. If you could interview any world leader right now, which leader would it be and why? Zelensky. Ah. Because I'm fascinated uh, with his courage. And of course, I'm somewhat curious about uh, the fact that he started out in comedy, but that's interestingly enough, not a big part of his story right now. But uh, I'm, I'm fairly fascinated with him. The person who uh, asked that question on Twitter X finished it by saying, we think he's the best, talking about you, Rick, and uh, we really do. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. So our full feature interview with Rick Mercer is coming up on Sunday. Up next, though, a story of survival after treading water for more than 23 hours. Pretty lucky, I suppose. I'm grateful. I'm grateful to be alive. I didn't think I'd be here. How a wristwatch saved this man's life in our moment. Will Franzen says he is so lucky to be alive after being pulled overboard by a marlin while out fishing off the coast of New Zealand. With no life jacket and his boat drifting out of reach, he survived by treading water for more than 23 hours before his wristwatch and some quick thinking saved his life. This survival story is our moment. Pretty lucky, I suppose. I'm grateful. It's grateful to be alive. I didn't think I'd be here. The fish lurched and instantly I just rolled into the water and tried to swim to the boat. About three strokes, I knew I was gonna make it. I had a shark come to visit. He went around, had a bit of a look, and decided I wasn't very tasty. And um, gratefully, you know, you uh, think about uh, your family and um, all your loved ones and your life. Well, I looked at it and got a bit of reflection. I thought, that's all I got. So I tried holding that up 
to signal this boat, uh, but I don't think they would have seen anything. What the hell's that? Um, should we go have a bit of a look? And he goes, oh, yeah, go on, we'll go have a look. Hello. You look right. a bit better than we last saw you. Thank you. Will you go out again? Oh, hell yeah, I'd be out this afternoon if they let me, but the boys were out fishing now. <laughs> I cannot imagine what it would be like to tread water for, like, half an hour, much less 23 hours. Rescuers said that he was incredibly cold, incredibly pale when they got to him. Uh, he is still looking for his boat, and he says he's going to install rails on it if he ever does get it. That is the National for January the 5th. Join me Sunday for Cross Country Checkup on CBC Radio and CBC News Network, and later that night, back here for the National. Have a great Saturday.